Welcome back, folks, to another devlog. For those of you just joining in, my name is Lou, and my goal is to build a single-player sci-fi first-person shooter roguelite with a heavy focus on looting to advance your own gear. Boy, that's a mouthful. For a recap of our progress, we have a mostly solid character controller, a spatial inventory system for the player, an equipment system so you can properly wear and hold weapons, containers and items which can be looted, and while each of these systems isn't perfect, I'm both too inexperienced and too early in the project to really worry about perfectionism. What is more important is getting towards a working prototype, as refinement will happen iteratively over time. To recap our goals for this video, uh, what we were going to do is create a proper item database for all of our items, doing some tool dev to help edit and spawn items in from that database, a proper implementation of stats and stat modifiers, uh, adding effects from armor modules so you can put them on your armor and they do something, having some method for the player to change what modules are on their armor, fixing inertia, both for when the player is moving and for what weapon they're holding, and possibly taking another crack at fixing the Mixamo animations for the player, uh, which we tried to do at the end of last episode, but it failed pretty hard. Something that wasn't on the docket, but that I did anyway, was take a look into adding assembly references and setting up our namespaces. I did this because I noticed my load time in editor was starting to get longer, and because I knew in the long run it's good practice. More on that when we get to it, though. Tracking straight into our first topic, the item database itself is actually quite simple. Really, it's just a scriptable object which holds all of our item data. Largely, this is fine, as most references to item data will be done via some other method done in the editor, such as pre-made loot tables. The only time we need to use the database at runtime would be if we wanted to directly give the player an item through something like the console command for debugging. Not really needed for regular play, but certainly helpful at this stage of development. A more complicated task came from uh, creating an editor for it. Using my mock-up from last episode, I started with blocking out the UI builder like I did with my custom inspectors. The two things I focused on at first was setting up a list view on the left to select an item from the database, and then embedding the correct inspector on the right, uh, which I had already made previously. I also added a button to the top to manually repaint the whole window just to make prototyping this that much faster. I have to say I spent most of my time trying to figure out the binding and formatting for the list view. Of the two, the binding is probably the simpler to figure out. As I understand it, the list view generates an array of clickable objects. I'm not sure if they're technically buttons, but I'm going to refer to them as buttons for the sake of brevity. The binding function, as I understand it, is about making sure that the button at index i of our list corresponds to the item at the same index in our data source. In our case, the list within our item database. You can then edit the contents of the button based on some values from the data source. In my case, I'm displaying the name of the item, and then a string that gets formatted to warn me if further setup is required. Essentially, it just checks if there are any null values in each field. Red means that it would be entirely unusable by the player, while yellow means that the player could use the item, uh, but that further setup is required. Inside each button, I wanted to have a tiny sprite inside it, too, just so that I could tell what I'm looking at at a glance. List views only have so many items created at any one time, and those are what the user can actually see. Anything above or below that is just destroyed. When creating new buttons, when you scroll, the make item function is called to determine what is actually inside that button. By default, it's just a new label, and in the coding reference, it doesn't really expand beyond that. I did try pointing to a function that would return a visual element, but any time I tried to set something up in that function, it would just return blank. I know it's possible to have custom formatting inside these list views, as I found forum posts of people discussing this exact topic. However, the material is quite sparse, and I've not really found a proper tutorial ex to explain everything that's going on with it. From there, I just decided to move on for the time being, because it was selecting items, and therefore was functional enough for what I needed it to do, and we'll come back to it someday. My next task was to speed up the creation of new item data. I added a button to the toolbar and created three fields. The first was the path that the item will be created at, the second will be the name of the item, and the third is a drop-down for the type of item data it will be. Right now it works perfectly fine, but when I was originally writing the code for it, I had to briefly step away and take care of something. When I came back, I clicked the button just to see if it would actually do anything while the code was unfinished. And it did do something. It ended up overwriting the entire item data folder, and got rid of pretty much every single scriptable object and its definition. I wasn't too tore up about it. I had like 10 items total, and the definitions weren't too complicated to remake. However, I did use this as a teachable moment and separated the item definitions from the folders I'd be putting those items into. Taking a closer look at the Stack Overflow post I was using for reference, I did notice that the second answer said I needed to generate a unique asset path so I wasn't overwriting the existing data. So I did that, 
I finished rigging up the button, and presto, we can now create item data with the click of a button, and edit it right here in the database window. The last bit of functionality I added was to spawn items into the scene view. I mentioned in the previous video that there was a decent amount of manual work I needed to do to properly set an item up for testing, but now all of that's automated. If I have an inventory grid selected, I can spawn the item inside the grid as an inventory item. Using our code from before, this then gets properly placed inside the grid when we enter play mode. Alternatively, I can spawn the item as a world item to be picked up off the ground, and it gets spawned with the proper prefab and inventory item inside of it. In the future, I'll want the item database tool to be able to parse an external CSV file to create items in mass, and I'll also want the ability to search through and query the database. I can hold off on both of those for now, though, as there really isn't all that much content for now. The main focus for the time being is core functionality, and that really only requires a couple items of each type. At this point of the week, my family went on a trip, and I was tasked with watching the dogs while they were gone. One of them has trouble navigating the stairs, so I had to work upstairs and remote downstairs into my own computer. I found that this caused quite a bit of lag, so entering play mode to debug things was quite a pain. As a result, I focused on something that required relatively minimal coding, and that was setting up assembly definitions in my project. Assembly definitions are collections of code that get recompiled together. Unity puts all of your scripts into one by default. Uh, in fact, I touched on that a little bit during my brief rant about object fields. Anytime a script in an assembly gets changed, it requires all the code within that assembly to get recompiled. For me, this resulted in about a minute of downtime on each recompilation, which this early in the project would add up in the long run. I bundled the item database, item data, inventory handlers, and item scripts all into one assembly. Everything related to the player and another, including inputs in the inventory controller, and everything else went into an assembly I called utilities, which both the database and the player need to reference for interactions, containers, and similar. At the same time, I implemented namespaces to further break up my code just for the sake of clarity. This did require some code, but it was largely to fix any broken references and didn't require hopping into play mode for the most part. These assemblies are still in flux and will likely change down the road. I'm probably going to wrap all of them into an even larger assembly when it comes time to work on the procedural generation, since that code and this code won't interact all that much. So prior to introducing stats, the way I held values for the walk speed, jump height, and so on was in a scriptable object containing a bunch of floats. This works, but it doesn't allow for modifiers to easily be added or removed from the base value. Luckily, this is a pretty common mechanic, and I was able to find this tutorial for a robust system by a guy called Kirzarel. 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 I'm just going to call him Kriz. For the base implementation, I pretty much followed that tutorial word for word. Once my family came back from their trip and I was able to crawl back into the basement, I started making them actually usable by the player. Kryze's system was seemingly meant to be hard-coded, each item having a script with code for what modifiers are to be applied to what stat. To start fully implementing this in a more dynamic way, I needed another class, which I called TargetStat, which holds a flex enum for the stat of the target and the modifier to be applied to that target. I then added an array of these target stats to armor modules and tweaked the code within the equipment manager to properly apply them to the correct stat. And bada bing bada boom, armor can now be customized from within the editor and actually give you those effects when warm. These values are ramped up to easily show the effect in video, but for gameplay they'll be much smaller values. Unfortunately, with the new restrictions posed by assemblies, I'm going to have to try and figure out how to add active player abilities. Assemblies don't allow for cyclical references, so I can't access any of the player scripts or inputs from the assembly from within the item database assembly. I'll keep tinkering with how I've got these set up. Like I said earlier, they're still in flux, so change is pretty likely. To try and block out how the player might go about customizing their gear at runtime, I whipped up a station in Blender to interact with. On one side, there's a slot you can insert an item into, and on the other, there's a screen displaying information about the item, what modules are already installed on it, and what modules can still be put into it. I used UI Toolkit to build this, because as I learn more about it, I'm finding it pretty simple to rig up buttons and display information. There are two list view components here with pretty awful formatting, but I already talked about that earlier with the item database tool. At very least, it's functional for now. Right now, there's no limits to the mods you can add to your armor, so I can cram as many as I want on here. Whee! In the future, I'm probably going to make two limitations. One is having subtypes of armor modules, like we have subtypes of armor data, to distinguish what modules can be equipped where. Putting a pouch on your forehead or a flashlight on your knee wouldn't really make sense after all. The second would be having some sort of limiting values. For example, your suit only having the power to have so many active abilities at a time, or the processing power to handle so much data from your passive abilities. You could pile as many of them on as you want and go over those values, but with significant drawbacks in the form of being underpowered and only partially operational. In the future, I'll also want to store module loadouts in some form. 
Two factions may use the same base equipment, but with different customizations installed, and each faction is likely to have mostly standardized equipment. I don't think this would be that hard to implement, but it's not of critical importance until NPCs are added to the project. Last time I talked about weapons weight, I mentioned adding inertia to the weapon. At the time, the weapon had a small sphere it could travel within, and it would move in the opposite direction of the player's movement. Now that I have a lerp implemented, the weapon will go back to its resting position after a short time, and this is to simulate the player's character adjusting their aim to this new direction of movement. However, this appears to only work when the velocity of the player is increasing. If we jump off of something tall, you'll see the initial movement and the readjustment of aim shortly after. When we land, you'd expect the weapon to over-travel towards the ground, however, that doesn't happen. The reason for this is because I'm using the velocity of the player as a proxy for the force being applied to the player, when in reality I should be using acceleration, which is the change of velocity over time. During our sudden stop, a force isn't exerted on the player, as far as unity is concerned, even if in real life this would be the case. Unity doesn't measure the acceleration of rigid bodies by default, so I'll need to either come up with a proxy value for the force being applied to the rigid body, or calculate the acceleration of our rigid body myself and plug that into our formula. I'm going to put this in the list of future refactors to do when I know what I'm doing, but like many other things in this episode, I'll just need to move on for the time being. After that, the next thing to work on is trying to fix the inertia for the player's body. This is kind of hard to explain just by showing footage of it, so I'm going to describe the problem with a graph. Previously, we had our walk, sprint, and crouch walk speeds as discrete values, and we'd limit our speed to whatever state we were in. Transitioning from walk to sprint had the desired effect of instantly speeding up. However, when transitioning from sprint to walking, that instant transition was undesirable, and would occur even if we were mid-jump, which felt jarring. I went back to Dave Game Dev's series on rigid body movement to see what his solution was during his episode on implementing sliding to his character controller. His solution was to add a coroutine to lerp to the new target value over time if the difference between the current value and the desired value was over some threshold. This is still dependent on our movement state though, so external objects acting on the player's body, such as this bounce pad, don't bounce as properly unless speed limiting is either disabled or we're already moving at a high speed. I may have to go back and rewrite the player movement script entirely to rely more on Unity's physics system to get the exact effect I want. The goal, so far as the physics sandbox is concerned, is to allow dynamic props to influence the gameplay. Blow up a flying vehicle? Well, when that burning wreck lines, it's going to be dangerous. Throw a grenade at a pile of boxes? Well, when the boxes get knocked around, they may have enough force to kill, or possibly just knock somebody off of a ledge. A buggy coming to run you over? It's going to need to deal damage based on its speed. Or maybe just a well-timed jump will allow you to ride it if it's going slow enough. Our current movement system doesn't allow these external forces to interact with the player in any meaningful way because of the speed limitation. Well, onto the to-do list it goes, because there really aren't a ton of external forces to exert on the player, after all, at the moment. Again, this is no time for perfectionism. While I had time to try and fit it into this video, I took another quick crack at the player animations. I re-imported the character as a generic avatar instead of a humanoid avatar, and it looks like my hunch regarding the masking of bones was correct. However, the result is still distinctly wobbly, so that solution goes out the figurative window. The idea regarding IK was to try aiming the torso with the weapon it was holding rather than one of the spine bones, and that just flat out didn't work, so that idea is gone too. During my initial testing, using the spine to aim resulted in the torso being squared up to the direction the character is looking. This would require additional IK because the arms would be out of line with the point of aim. Adding an offset angle meant that when looking left and right, the player limits would also be offset by that much. It seems like the simple solution is to just make a custom new walk cycle that doesn't affect the entire upper body which would require time to learn how to do so in Blender. Alternatively, I could just pay to get them made, which I'm currently hesitant to do. A more complex system would be trying to make a procedural animation system for the entire character, which personally I think is a big ask for what I'm trying to do. Either way, unless I get pointed to a source that explains otherwise, it sounds like this may be a project all on its own. So once again, to the to-do list it goes. If you guys know of resources or references that might help me along, hit me up in the comments. I may not have finished every task I set out to do in this video, but I did get a decent amount done. For the next video, as promised, I'm going to be focusing on weapons, ballistics, damage, explosions, and so on. However, after that video, I've got a choice of what to work on. I could either go back and refactor our player once again to address the things we couldn't accomplish in this video, specifically in regards to the abilities and physics of the player. I could start venturing into the procedural generation of levels, or I could start venturing into making AI characters that fight both with and against the player. Procedural generation and AI are both new territory for me, but I do have ideas about how to go about each. If you know what you'd like to see, type that in the comments as well. As always, subscribe to stay notified, and liking and sharing the video always helps a ton. Plan for the next video, just like this one, is for it to come out in two weeks. Ciao, I'll see you next time.
But the dog is barking one sec. <laughs> well, I'm glad this is take three. The dog just went ballistic. I kind of hope that I... <laughs> I kind of hope I caught that in the uh, audio recording, but he's upstairs, so I don't know if it did. Anyways, continuing on, no more wheeze.